There's a lot of confusion out there about reincarnation in past lives, and this confusion can keep you from accessing valuable information that could help you in your life today. You may not realize this, but your past lives heavily influence your current life, both positively and negatively. And the more you know about how all of this works, the more you can use your past life experiences to take you to higher levels of consciousness than ever before. In this video, I'm going to answer the top two questions I get asked most about past lives, and then you are going to learn how reincarnation works step by step. Coming up. Hello, beautiful soul. This is Christina Lopes, the Heart Alchemist, here to help you open your heart, heal your past, and live with purpose. If you're new to my videos, click on that subscribe button and also on the bell so you get notified as soon as I publish new content. And follow me over on Instagram where I share tips and advice that you won't find here on YouTube. I recently did a video about karma, and in that video that I was talking about karma, I'm gonna leave a link to that video in the description box below for you to watch after this one if you're interested. But in that video, I talked a lot about past lives, and so I got a ton of questions uh, and comments asking for me to go into the topic of, of past lives, reincarnation. That's exactly what I'm going to do in this video. Now, the topic of reincarnation is really deep and very complex, so what I've done is I've actually broken the topic into two videos, so this is actually a two-part series. This is part one of the series, and then in my next video is going to be part two of the series of the continuation of talking about reincarnation. In this first video, we're going to talk about, I'm gonna answer the top two questions I get asked most about reincarnation, and then I'm going to take you through the step-by-step -step process of how reincarnation works, so that you know once and for all how this works and you can better work. The more that you understand reincarnation, it means that you can better work with your past life experiences to help you in your life today. And then in part two, in the second video of this series, we're going to go over how past lives affect you in real time and then how to heal them, all right? So that's the two part series, okay? So on to video number one of the series. Part one is common questions. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna answer the two top questions that I get asked most about past lives. The first one is, let's get this one out of the way. The first one is, are past lives real? <laughs> so in short, yes, they're real. Um, there are some people and scientists uh, from around the world who have con kind of gone into past life experiences and tried to explain them and study them. And a lot of scientists believe that past life memories are just really your brain either imagining something or your brain creating what's known as false memories, all right? But I strongly disagree with the way that, that past life memories are seen in mainstream scientific science right now. Um, so strongly disagree with that. And what I'm gonna be using in this video is I'm going to be using not only my experience in working with my own past lives, but also in working with hundreds of clients and helping hundreds of clients from all over the world through regressions. Uh, so I'm gonna bring a little bit of that experience into this video. So basically what past life, the most significant thing that I find that really kind of stands out as proof, uh, even though I can't prove any of this to you, right? So you have to remember that. Uh, but what stands out as the strongest support for past lives and for the existence of past lives is that when we access past life memories, sometimes spontaneously, there is an enormous amount of healing that was never possible before. So I've worked with people who come to me after being in psychotherapy for years and years and years, they can't seem to get to the root of their problem, and then we do a regression or we do a guided meditation, a guided healing, we access some past life memories, and boom, the person in one session has a breakthrough. Now, to me, this is not possible if that person were just making stuff up. <laughs> okay, so the deep level of healing that I've seen, not just in my own work, but in the work of people that I really admired, I actually started going into past life uh, experiences way before my spiritual awakening through the work of Brian Weiss. Dr. Brian Weiss is a world-renowned psychiatrist who was a mainstream psychiatrist and then ha started having experiences with patients as he was putting them under hypnosis he started to see that they were accessing memories that were not of this lifetime, and that's how his work started. So he's probably the most well-known expert in past life memories and past life regression on the planet, 
And I started, uh, I started learning about past lives through him. Even before my spiritual awakening, I was already curious about this stuff. I went to, to take a weekend workshop with Dr. Brian Weiss uh, in New York uh, years ago. And so that's how I started. I, I got into the whole past life thing. Then I had my own spiritual awakening and then I started coaching people and I started healing not only my own past lives, but then also working with people. So that brought everything to a whole new level. If you want to go deeper on the topic of past lives and reincarnation, you want to get into Dr. Brian Weiss's work that I highly, highly recommend. I recommend you start with the book, Many Lives, Many Masters. It's a New York Times bestseller. Uh, he has many New York Times bestsellers, but this is the one that I love the most out of all of his books. So I'm going to leave a link to the, in the description box for that book if you want to get into that. But basically what you need to start thinking about in terms of past lives is really the, the way that I like to talk about it is to just ask people to broaden their view of what they think existence is. That's the easiest way for you to get started with, with uh, reincarnation and learning about past lives. So instead of thinking that your life starts at birth in this lifetime and then ends with your death and then that's it, you're buried and, and that, that's the end of you. <laughs> Past life, the way to see it from, from a soul perspective is that past lives really, they're the only thing that makes sense actually in the broader scheme. Because if it were just you coming in, uh, you know, uh, being born and then dying, there would be no evolution of consciousness anywhere, right? The evolution of consciousness, the evolution of all that is, the evolution of the universes, the evolution of all of existence depends on your soul and on the bazillions of other souls out there. It depends on all of these streams of consciousness moving through different expressions, different experiences, non-stop. <laughs> okay. So when you broaden your view, the truth is that your soul has been on a multi-lifetime path for eons of time. <laughs> you've probably been here conservatively hundreds of times that you've been on this planet, sometimes even more than that, sometimes less. There are souls that have been on, that are on the planet right now that haven't been here many times, but they've been incarnating in other realities. Okay. So the broader view here is to just think of your soul as this enormous stream of consciousness. And that enormous stream of consciousness evolves through a multi lifetime, uh, perspective, continually expanding, continually growing, taking its gifts and its learnings and all of that into, into each new lifetime that it incarnates in. Okay. So you're never born a blank slate, <laughs> but you are born with a lot of information that you bring from other past lives. The second question I get asked most is why don't we remember past lives? <laughs> So this one, this one's interesting because there's a lot operating here. So there are really two reasons, two main reasons why we don't remember past lives for the most part. Okay. Because we can access past lives, especially when we spiritually awaken. And when we start to develop spiritually, we are then able to access more past lives. But in general, we can't really access past lives or we don't really access past lives until we awaken. And there are two main reasons for this. Okay. The first one is that the soul here on earth is operating with what's known as the veil of forgetfulness. <laughs> And the veil of forgetfulness is basically one of the many rules of this reality. And, you know, let me leave here just a little side note, a ding ding here. And the side note is that your soul incarnates, not just here on planet earth, your soul incarnates in many other realities at the same time, but I'm not going to go into that because that's going to get way complicated, but your soul doesn't just live one little life at a time. It's not linear like that. Your soul is living multiple existences, multiple realities at the same time. So think of your soul kind of like an octopus, the head of an octopus and the octopus has a bunch of legs. That's what your soul does. It throws itself. It extends itself into different realities at the same time so that it, it can evolve. Now, when it comes to planet earth, when the soul agrees, when the soul wants to come down here, it has to abide by the rules of each reality. And one of the rules down here for planet earth for evolution on planet earth is called the veil of forgetfulness. And what the veil of forgetfulness means is that you have sort of a cover put over you that 
kind of erases, it doesn't really erase, but it conceals, that's a better word. It conceals all of the stuff that you've been through on a soul level. So you forget, you forget where you come from, you forget what you've been through, you forget the lifetimes that you've had, you forget all of that, okay? Now, the you that forgets this, that's another, another thing that you have to remember about that, is that the you that forgets this isn't the soul, all right? So think of yourself, there are two parts operating here, the lower self and the higher self, okay? The lower self is your human part. That's the body. That's what you're seeing here in this video. Okay. It's the body. It's my mind. It's my ego, my personality. That's the lower self. All right. But then you have the higher components of yourself, your soul, your higher self. So those components never forget anything. <laughs> it's the lower self that's veiled with this veil of forgetfulness. The reason that this is so important in the reality of planet earth is that the veil of forgetfulness provides an accelerated path for your soul ev evolution. <laughs> it accelerates your soul evolution. And the reason that it does that, the reason that the veil of forgetfulness does this is because it adds diversity of experience to your soul's repertoire. Okay. So when your soul comes down here, the veil of forgetfulness comes over your lower self, meaning I don't, I can't really access past life memories until I spiritually awaken, which is why you're watching this video today until I spiritually awakening, awaken. And then I start to access past lives more easily and more readily. But until then that veil of forgetfulness is pretty strong in me. And what that is doing is it's freeing up the lower self to try new things. <laughs> you see the ding ding here? When I have a veil of forgetfulness over me, I get to do things and choose to do things in a different way than maybe I ever had before. So if I didn't have the veil of forgetfulness, I might just continue doing things the same way I did before. <laughs> what the veil of forgetfulness does is it allows for a multiplicity of experiences. It allows for a diversity of experiences and it's through diversity of experience that your soul evolves. So the more diversity of experience your soul has, the faster it evolves. Okay. So now let me give you an example from my clinical years to, to show you how diversity of experience really is an evolutionary thing for your soul. Okay. Your soul is constantly evolving through experience. All right. You have to remember that your soul evolves through experience. The more experience I have, the more my soul evolves, the more diverse that experience, the faster my soul evolves. All right. So here's an example from, from my years as a clinician to illustrate how this works. Let's say that someone has a really severe injury in their right arm and their, where their whole right arm goes paralyzed, completely paralyzed. All right. Now let's say that person was right hand dominant. Now what's going to happen to me if my right arm goes completely limp, I can't use it anymore. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to learn how to become left hand dominant without question. Cause I just lost my left arm. All right. And so the moment that I switch from being right arm dominant to left arm dominant, what am I doing? I'm adding experience to my repertoire. I'm adding diversity of experience to my repertoire. And that makes my soul evolve faster because now my soul has in its portfolio, right handedness. And it also has left handedness. You see, it all becomes a part of the soul's experience. And that diversity is what allows the soul to evolve faster and faster. Now I want to leave a side note here. So ding, ding. I want to leave a little side note before we move on to the rest of the video. The side note is that this veil of forgetfulness has different thicknesses. Okay. So it has different thickness depending on where you are in your own personal evolution and depending on what your personal mission here on the planet is. All right. So I'm sure you've heard of, cause this happens quite frequently of children who have detailed past lives stories. I think I've seen some of them even on Oprah where children come on and they're detailing past life memories and they're just kids. So they haven't really had a spiritual awakening. So what's going on? Why is the veil of forgetfulness almost non-existent for these children? Well, they were born with thinner veils of forgetfulness, probably because it has something to do with their life mission. Probably they are very advanced old souls. And so as they become more and more evolved, the veil of forgetfulness is less necessary. It could also be that your veil of forgetfulness can become thinner and thinner 
as you spiritually awaken and as you start to fulfill your soul mission. Okay. So that happened to me where, when I had my spiritual awakening, the veil of forgetfulness got really thin, especially for a period of time where I really needed to heal stuff from past lives. So the veil of forgetfulness thinned and then I healed and healed and healed. And then I started to come back to normal in terms of, of being able to, to kind of have that, that veil of forgetfulness then sort of came back on because it thinned enough for me to heal what I needed to heal. And then I don't need to keep ac accessing past lives. Although sometimes I still do, but I did a lot more in the beginning of my spiritual awakening as a part of my healing journey. And then as th this healing journey for me, then gets translated in me helping you access past lives and heal them. So it was a part of my mission. So the veil of forgetfulness has different thicknesses for each one of us, depending on what we're doing here, depending on our level of evolution and depending on what your soul mission is for this lifetime. The second reason why we don't remember past lives is that the soul blocks access to them until it's time. <laughs> So the soul does this, the soul, remember it's the soul that brings this veil of forgetfulness over you. And the soul will continue to block access to past life experiences until it's time. Now uh, this until it's time is impossible for me to quantify for you because your soul will know when it's time for you. But the reason that the soul is blocking access to past lives is, is the soul would really never expose you to something you would be unprepared to go through or unprepared to heal. And this happened to me actually. And this is, this was one of the greatest lessons that I first learned about past life regressions was that the soul will only show you what you are prepared to see and heal and not more. And this happened in my own life. When I started doing, uh, I started to have what's called auto regressions. I'll talk about this a little bit further down in the video. But I started to go into spontaneous past life regressions while I was in meditation during my spiritual awakening. And, and one day I had a really, really intense, uh, memory and I had an intense memory and I could see the story and then it was just all went black. And I, I'm not going to go over the details of the story because it's very personal, but I was seeing something and then I stopped seeing it. And I kept asking my guides, why can't I see the rest of the story? I don't understand. I feel like this memory was cut in half. I'm, I'm not understanding. And all that I kept receiving intuitively was I had enough of that memory to heal. And that's all I needed to know at that moment. Well, I kept working with that memory. I healed what I had. I knew there was stuff left over from that regression that I hadn't completed, but I trust the process. And about, I think it was six months later, I forget time now, but I think it was somewhat like six months later, I was sitting in meditation and boom, the rest of the regression came to me. And then I figured out why that whole regression hadn't come to me. And it was because it was excruciatingly painful, very difficult to see and witness and heal. And so you see, that's when I really got it. My soul hadn't given me the whole regression months before because I wasn't ready yet to process that level of pain. Okay. So this is something to leave with you. If you're afraid of going into past lives, or if you're, if you feel any kind of fear of doing a regression or anything like that, I'm going to talk about regressions later on. If you feel any fear around accessing past life memories, this should really assure you because you cannot access past life memories until your soul deems you are ready to pre prepared to not only witness it, but also heal it. Okay. So this is the second reason we can't remember past lives usually is precisely because your soul will block them until you're ready to process them. And even if you're ready to process, your soul is still in one lifetime. Your soul's not going to show you all of your past history, right? Cause remember you've been here probably hundreds of times conservatively. So have I seen the hundreds and possibly thousands of lifetimes? that I've had here on earth? No, I have no idea, but have I accessed important ones that I needed to access in order to heal and go into higher levels of consciousness? Yeah. I would say I've probably accessed anywhere from maybe 10 to 15 lifetimes within my own healing journey. So, so think about that 10 to 15 lifetimes that I've accessed in my own healing journey out of the hundreds and possible thousands of lifetimes that I've had here. Okay. So that's still a really small percentage but it doesn't matter. I don't need to access all of them. The soul knows that it blocks what needs to be blocked and it opens you up to what you need to access and heal.
Okay, on to part two of the video, and that is how reincarnation works. <laughs> so the topic of reincarnation is extremely complex. Um, I've simplified it by creating this six step loop. It's in a loop so that you can realize that the steps all lead back to each other. That's why I made it in a loop. Okay. So I could really start explaining in any step of this loop, but I'm going to do the loop in this sequence, but just remember that it, everything always circles back to each other. Okay. So step one of the reincarnation loop is what's known as life planning. Then we're going to review the second step, which is avatar programming. The third step is birth and life. The fourth step is the death process. Fifth step is life review. And then the sixth step is hangout, spiritual hangout. And then it loops back to life programming again. All right. So don't freak out about these names here. I'm going to explain each one of these steps. Uh, now. Okay. So step number one in this reincarnation loop is what's known as life planning. So you would be surprised at just how much of your lifetime is planned. Your soul plans everything before it incarnates into a body. Your soul plans so many details, so many details not only what experiences it wants to experience, but also it chooses your biological family. You establish soul contracts with your biological family. You establish soul contracts with a bunch of other souls for you to meet down here and do your thing and all evolve together. Okay. So there's an enormous amount of complexity in the life planning. Your soul chooses everything, your gender, uh, uh, all of these things, all of these things, the soul is choosing prior to you coming down here. Now there's a couple of things that are interesting and, and we need to talk about here when it comes to life planning. That's really pertinent. I can't get into all the details that, that of the programming that your soul really plans, but just remember that so much of your life is programmed prior to you coming here. Okay. So that's the most important part. Now let's talk about this life planning for light workers and for non light workers. Okay. If you've been watching my videos and resonate with me, you're probably a light worker. And so when it comes to this life planning, the life planning for light workers is a little different than the life planning for non light workers. And again, it doesn't mean that light workers are better than non light workers. That's it's not, it's nothing like that. It's that light workers have different reasons for coming down here. Okay. So a non light worker, generally a non light working soul will generally have a life plan or a, a life programming that is very focused on personal evolution on a soul level. Okay. So a non light working soul will mostly plan their life and mostly plan their lifetime around their own personal evolution and what needs to happen for their soul to evolve more and more and more. Okay. So that's generally the primary driving, uh, uh, kind of force behind the life planning of a non light worker soul. The light worker soul on the other hand is a little bit different. So the light worker soul, when a light worker soul is doing their, their life planning, they are also really, um, you know, concentrated on personal evolution because all souls are concentrated on personal evolution. So the, the, one of the, the key forces of each one of our souls is evolution, constant evolution, right? It's one of the driving forces of the soul. But for light workers, there's a little added ding ding here. Okay. So the light worker soul not only is thinking about personal evolution when they are planning their life before they come down here, they also have a driving question that every light soul, uh, that every light worker soul has. And that is how can I help? <laughs> okay. So this is, this is the, the other little driving feature that's different from a non light worker soul. So the light worker soul will plan their life before they come, not just based on their personal evolution, what they want to experience on a personal level, but they also plan their life to be of service to others. So how can I go down there to planet earth and evolve? And how can I help others in the process? All right. So this is all of the things that go into the life planning aspect. This is before you come down here, you're doing your homework up there. And this is kind of the differences between in life planning between non light workers and light worker souls. If you want to go deeper into the topic of the light worker mission, I'm going to leave a link to a video, uh, in the description box below. It's a video I did on the light worker mission. So you can go deeper into that topic after watching this video. 
Step two in the loop of reincarnation is what's known as avatar programming. <laughs> And so avatar programming essentially means that your soul is going to work overtime in the initial phases of your life down here on planet earth, meaning in utero. Okay. So your soul is really, really heavily focused and working very hard in the initial stages of your life, of your conception down here on planet earth. So what usually happens is the soul will keep checking into your mom's uh, womb. It'll keep checking into the little body that's developing. It'll keep checking in and out. It's not fully immersed into the body yet in this phase uh, of your, um, of the reincarnation process. And what the soul is doing initially is it's starting to program that little tiny body. It's starting to program it, but it's also checking in and seeing if it still wants to be here. <laughs> Cause although a lot of things are planned, the soul still has on the spot decision-making to do. And a lot of times what happens is when the soul decides, you know, you've established these contracts, your, your family of birth, all of these things prior, but then your parents, when incarnated ahead of you, right? A lot of shenanigans could have happened to them down here on planet earth. They could have completely forgotten. They had a soul contract with you, which majority of the time that's what's happened. They could have gone through shenanigans in their lives. And so after you make the soul contract with the soul, it doesn't mean that it has to be executed in a lifetime. Okay. So I wanted to leave this ding ding here, this side note here. And that is that although a lot of things are pre planned before you get here, it doesn't mean that they pan out. Okay. <laughs> and the reason that that happens is because the soul knows that when it incarnates in this 3d reality, in this reality of density, that the shit can hit the fan <laughs> really all all kinds of shenanigans can happen. And so the soul is used to that. It's not a big deal. It's not a tragedy for the soul. If the things that it planned up there didn't end up panning out down here. Okay. So I wanted to leave this side note just to reassure you. Okay. That yes, there's a lot that's planned, but a lot of times plans change and things change when you incarnate down here, because this is a dense reality and we just forget a lot when we're down here. Okay. So that's a little side note I wanted to leave you. So what the soul does, especially in the first trimester, the soul starts to program the little body. It's starting to program that little body, but it's also checking in and deciding for sure if it wants to stay or no, maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm going to wait a little bit because the situation has changed down there. My birth parents seem, you know, something happened here. So the, the soul ultimately makes these decisions even after pregnancy. That's why miscarriages in the first trimester of pregnancy are quite common because the soul hasn't yet materialized. It hasn't anchored fully in the body. It's just keeps checking in. Okay. And seeing if it wants to stay. So that is all happening in utero and the programming is happening. There's so much work that the soul does before you come out of your mama's womb. And the reason that this is happening, the reason that the programming is happening so heavily in utero is for two reasons. The soul has an opportunity in your mom's womb that it will never have again. And it, two things are happening in the womb that that's why the soul works overtime in the nine months of pregnancy to prepare you for this lifetime. The two things are this one, you're floating in a water medium, ding, ding. <laughs> You are floating in a water medium. Water is a high conductor of electricity, AKA it's a high conductor of energy, meaning that your soul can pump and beam down much more information and it can be integrated and worked through when you are immersed in water. Okay. So that the soul takes advantage of that beautiful coincidence or not of you floating around for nine months in a water medium. Okay. So water conductor of electricity, conductor of energy, the soul takes advantage of that medium to program you and beam down more and more programs. Okay. So that's the first reason that the soul works on overtime during pregnancy. The second reason is that when you are in utero, you don't have a sense of self yet. Other, in other words, you don't have an ego. <laughs> and so the soul takes advantage of that because let me tell you, one of the hardest things for the soul to work around is the damn ego. <laughs> 
because the ego can become a blocking force for the will of the soul later on. And so when you're in utero and you don't have a, you don't have an ego, the soul's like, yeah. <laughs> so it keeps programming and programming and programming while it has a chance. Okay. So these are the two main reasons why so much programming is occurring in utero. Now, initially this programming, this, this exchange of information is very one-sided in this, uh, in this initial, in this initial phase of programming. When your, uh, when your programming starts, when the avatar programming, this step of the reincarnation loop starts, the flow of information is very one-sided. It's coming from the soul down mostly. All right. But what I want you to remember is that the flow of information isn't always one-sided and it's going to start shifting in later steps that I talk about. But in this step of avatar programming, that's usually occurring mostly in utero, this, uh, this step in this step, the information is more, the information process, the information flow is going more one-sided meaning from the soul down instead of from the avatar up. Okay. But I want you to remember that it, that the information will start flowing in both directions at some point. Step number three in the reincarnation loop is birth and life. <laughs> this is where all the fun takes place, all right? This is, you come out of your mama's womb and boom, you have a new meat suit. <laughs> you have a new body that your soul has never had before. Cause think about this, ding, ding, side note, think about this. Even though your soul has incarnated possibly hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of times, even though your soul has been around the block so many times, it has never incarnated in this exact configuration that you have right now. <laughs> you have never had a body, a personality. Uh, you've never had yourself the way that you are right now. The Christina that you see in these videos, I have never existed in this exact arrangement, even though my soul's been around the block many, many times. That's why this is so evolutionary for the soul, because each time it incarnates, it incarnates in a different body. And that diversity of experience accelerates the soul's evolution. So when you pop out of your mama's womb, you are now ready for life. And this is where the flow of information now becomes more, uh, bilateral. Okay. So now what's happening initially when you come out of mama's womb in those initial years, the programming is still heavily coming from the, the top down from the soul into the lower self. And this is because there's so much to program in you, right? Like remember your soul has been around for eons of time. And so it's got a lot that it wants to program into your little avatar. So there's a lot of programming, not only occurring in your, in utero, but also in the first years of life. And even though, even though you pop out of mama's womb and you're no longer in a water medium. So the soul has kind of lost that, uh, it's kind of lost that, uh, that little, uh, advantage, but it's got another advantage that it, that it, it really uses in these first years of life. And that is it uses the brain waves that your brain generates. Okay. So so early on in life, your brain is generating, especially in these first years up to six years old, your brain generates a wavelength. That's really beautiful. A brain wave called theta. All right. And theta brain waves are beautiful because theta brain waves, they're almost a hypnotic brain wave. It's the brain wave of insight of learning new things of it's literally the hypnosis. It's, it's called the hypnosis brain wave. And so up to six years old, you're usually in this brainwave. So the soul takes advantage of this brainwave and keeps programming, programming, programming all of the things it wants to programming. It's trying to kind of pile up the programming until what? Until your ego comes online. <laughs> and then when your personality, your sense of self, your ego starts to come online, then the soul goes, God damn it. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. Now I've, I lost complete control over her because now she's going to go do her thing because she has an ego. Now she has a personality self. She's going to make decisions on her own. She's going to start doing all of this. Okay. So the ego takes advantage of these early years where your brain waves are in theta to continue to program you with things that are important. 
Then when you reach about six to seven years old, and I was just talking about this, that your ego starts to come online, there's also a different brainwave that comes online at this time, and it's the alpha brainwave. The alpha brainwave is a brainwave that's now more, whereas the theta brainwave was a brainwave that was more hypnotic turn inward, the alpha brainwave now is a brainwave that starts bringing on critical thinking and all of these other uh, brain activities going on, and so now you're, now the child or your little avatar starts to become more curious about the world, but not only just curious about the world, but their place in the world. So that's where the ego starts to come online. And at this moment, when the ego starts to come online, the programming coming from the soul, it's the, the information starts to become more bilateral. <laughs> it starts to become more bilateral because now that my ego and my personality start to come online, I start to make decisions for myself more and more. And that means that not only is the soul now communicating to me, but my lower self is communicating to the soul. And so the soul continues to gather this information and evolve from this new information that it's retrieving from me. Because remember, although my soul's been around the block many times, it's never been in this body with this personality and this ego. So when I start to beam up information from my ex new experiences down here, the soul is learning. Step number four in the reincarnation loop is the death process, okay? Now in the death process, this takes a while. Sometimes it can take weeks. Sometimes it, it, takes, a, it takes a while for some of us. Sometimes it's faster for others. But the death process is basically when your soul is preparing to disengage from the body, okay? It's a disengaging of the body. So whereas, re remember in, in, uh, in the steps before, you were going through life, you were being programmed by the soul, the soul was coming down in utero and it was starting to program the baby, including not just with programs from past lives, but also with the etheric layers, the aura, the chakras, they, they were all being programmed into the little baby in utero. Now in the death process, what's happening is the precise the opposite. So now your soul disengages the auric field, your electromagnetic field, your chakras. It takes all of the information that it has acquired in all of the years that it was in this body and it pulls it out. It pulls all of the information from your physical avatar and without the soul's essence in there, the physical avatar dies. Okay. So this is essentially the, the death process. It's that crossing over process. Sometimes it takes a while. So even after the soul disengages, even after the soul pulls the electromagnetic field, the aura and the chakras out of the body and the body then dies, even when that happens, that's, it still takes a while for the soul to cross over. Sometimes some teachers say it can take days. That's been my experience is that the crossing pro the crossing over process can take up to a week. Uh, but again, this isn't set in stone. It can take a while for the soul to disengage. And then after it disengages, it collects all of that information. All of that information merges back to the soul and then the soul goes back home. Okay. So the merging, means that when the soul disengages from the body, it's got a ton of information to retrieve. So the way you can think about this is kind of like a computer. All right. So think of a computer and imagine that I grab an external drive and I plug it into the computer and I take all the programming out of the computer, everything. I leave nothing in that computer. I take it out. I put it, put it in the external drive and then I unplug it. The moment that I do that, that I take all of the information, all of the programming out of the computer, what's the computer left with? Nothing. It's just a piece of metal basically there doing nothing because the computer without programming is nothing. So that's exactly what happens to your body. When the soul pulls out all of the programming, when it pulls out all of the information, this is all information, information that you've acquired from years of being on earth, from all of your experiences, all of your adventures, everything that you live down here, is stored in your cells as information. And so when the soul's pulling out, it's going to grab your entire energy field and all of the information that you have stored in your biological system. It's going to take it. That energy is going to merge back into the soul and then the soul crosses over. Okay. So this is the, this is generally the death process. Uh, it's a process that the soul is very used to. And remember, this is a little side note that I wanted to leave here. 
the death process occurs when the soul wants to go. Okay. So I've had a ton of people ask me questions about, you know, uh, did that person die because they wanted to, uh, did they leave too soon? Uh, and so there's a lot of questions about this. Now, from a human perspective, it may feel like sometimes a soul leaves when it's not ready, but from a soul and spiritual perspective, that's never true because the will of the soul is absolutely predominant. So your soul is going to leave your body whenever it wants to. Okay. That's not up to you. Your personality can't control that. So when the soul is ready to go, this is the death process that you go through. All of the information goes with the soul and what's left is basically a shell of what you were because the body without the infusion of soul energy dies. I also want to leave another little side note on the death process before I move into the next step of the reincarnation loop. And that is to, it's a kind of a reassurance to you because so many of us are afraid of death. So even talking about the death process can be a little bit uncomfortable to some people, but really when you're going through the death process, always remember this, you are never alone. <laughs> even it, it's, it's a solitary process in the sense that only you are going through the death process when it's your turn. And when your soul wants to leave, you are going through your own death process. And even if you're surrounded by family and by family members and friends, you're still going through that yourself, but you're never alone in the sense that even if you're alone in a room, when you die, you're never really alone because you are accompanied by so many on the spiritual side. Okay. So you're accompanied by your angels. You are surrounded by so much love. You are surrounded by your teams that have guided you throughout life. You are never alone. The death process is not a lonely one. You are welcomed. You are helped. And this has in fact been corroborated by so many people, including many of my clients who have lost loved ones. And they have told stories of being in the room when that person was passing over and they could feel things. I had a recent client tell me that she could hear whispering going on in the room uh, and it wasn't human whispering. Okay. So it was like a little faint whispering. Other people say they feel like movements of air when this is happening. So there's a lot going on in the spiritual side that people can't see, but in the death process, you are never alone. You're so loved and you are so accompanied. Okay. So I hope this reassures you if you're still afraid of death. Step number five is the life review. <laughs> okay. So when your soul goes through the death process, it pulls its energy out of a physical avatar, the body dies, and then the soul transitions over to the other side with all of the information acquired from the lifetime that you just lived, then comes an important step in the reincarnation loop. And that is the life review. So what happens here is the soul will, it usually doesn't, it, it, you can kind of think of it as a gathering or a little meeting <laughs> and with your guys under components of your team. And so what's going on in this life review is your soul is reviewing what's gone well, what hasn't gone so well. Although from a soul perspective, nothing really not doesn't go well because the soul the soul takes advantage of everything. So even if you've had some twists and turns down here that the soul didn't plan prior, the soul just takes it. It doesn't, it doesn't complain. It takes it. Why? Because all of your experiences down here are information that feeds the soul's evolution. So the soul doesn't, doesn't mind even the twists and turns. So in the life review, a lot of things are going on. You're uh, assessing whether you, you did kind of what you had planned on a soul level. You assess all the, the, the turns, the twists and turns that your life had. You assess whether your life mission was complete or not. You assess whether you were able to heal all of the pain that needed to be healed from the past because the soul is always looking to drop baggage in a lifetime. The, the soul, one of the driving features of the soul is evolution. I've talked about that. Another driving feature of, of the soul is the release of old baggage, healing of wounds. That's very important on the soul's priority list because the soul knows that it can only go as high as it drops weight. Okay. So it's, it knows that it has to let go and heal pain. 
So the soul has no problem with that. And in fact, it programs your body, your avatar to be able to have these opportunities of healing throughout your life. And so in the life review, it's going to go over these things. Did I fulfill my life mission? Was I able to heal a bunch of pain that I had brought from other lifetimes? Was I able to do that? How did I exit the life? Did I exit this lifetime in a high vibration? How, how did I exit this life? Did I exit this lifetime in a lot of guilt and shame and a lot of things unresolved? And the reason that the soul goes through all of this is because this life review is then going to be super important in the life planning step that's going to come after in this loop, because the soul is going to do a life review. Then it's going to hang out a little bit. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. And then it's going to go right back to step one again, life planning for another lifetime. So this life review is going to give the soul very important information that it then is going to use in the life planning stage. Because for example, let me give you an example. Let's say you crossed over and your ego, you know, when you were, when you were down here in the world, your ego just got really hardened and it did not let your soul, it didn't let your soul take over. It didn't listen to the soul. And you just lived a really suffered life because this ego never, never gave up control. And so what's going to happen in that circumstance is in the life review, the soul is going to say, wow, uh, you know, I transitioned and within me, within the energy field of this, of this lifetime, there was shame, sorrow, guilt, a lot of heavy emotions that I wasn't able to process in that human avatar. So guess what the soul is going to do? It's going to include the processing of those emotions in the life planning for the next life. Okay. Because the soul knows it has to let go and heal all of this stuff in order to continue its evolution. All right. So the soul is always looking for opportunities to heal and evolve. And so if there's, if there's any unleft, uh, unfinished uh, uh, business that was left undone in the life review, the soul is going to take note of that and it's going to include it in the life planning. All right. So this life review, it usually occurs pretty immediately after the death process. So the death process, soul goes back home, life review occurs pretty quickly. And then we go on to the next step. Step number six of the reincarnation loop is the spiritual hangout. <laughs> And so this, this is where your soul hangs out. This is the time frame in between lifetimes and it's impossible for you to quantify how much it's going to be. Sometimes your soul chooses to be on the other side for a few years in linear time. Although on the other side, time isn't linear, but in linear time, sometimes your soul will choose to be on the other side for a few years, sometimes for decades, sometimes for hundreds of years before coming back here again. <laughs> And I, I don't know, I don't know how long it takes. I don't know why the soul chooses to stay sometimes longer and sometimes not. What I will say, ding, ding, uh, because I've had experience with that, the souls of light workers, ding, 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 the souls of light workers tend to stay in the spiritual hangout in between lifetimes. They tend to stay in those spiritual hangouts less time than non light workers. And the reason is because the, remember, as I talked about earlier in this video, one of the driving features of the light worker soul is how can I help? It's, it's the, the light worker soul is always looking to help. And so the light worker soul gets to the other side, it hangs out for a while, but then it's ready to come back to help. Okay. So, uh, that's one thing that, that I've noticed is that light workers spend less time on the other side and they're ready to come right back. And then once this spiritual hangout is over, then you're back to step one, which is the life planning again. And then you start the whole loop over and over and over. And you know, that's pretty much how the reincarnation loop works. Um, you know, and I said, and as I said earlier in the video, this is happening in multiple ways at the same time, because your soul doesn't just incarnate in one place at one at a time. Okay. It incarnates in multiple places at the same time. Remember your soul is enormous. It's an enormous, enormous stream of consciousness that's experiencing its own evolution in various different realities. All right, beautiful soul. Now over to you. Let me know in the comments below, which details surprised you the most about reincarnation. Let me know. Click here to subscribe to my YouTube channel or head over to my website to download my free meditations. They're really powerful and check this video out about karma. This will be a great continuation of this conversation we just had here. All right, beautiful soul. I love you. I'm out.